everyone. My name is Cheryl Peralt. I'm here with my friend Ruth Edmonds Hill today. <laughs> we are both in uh, the space of uh, something we love in life being books and stories and here to talk about stories and people uh, that make stories happen. And the idea of the program that Ruth is helping me to get launched today through HCAM TV. Uh, the title is Common Ground True Storytelling uh, through HCAM TV, which I am planning to host uh, once a month and in, put a call out to community for a five minute true stories on the idea of the moth or uh, true storytelling programs you might be familiar with or sitting around the kitchen table or the campfire. And with the idea that uh, true storytelling is a way of bringing communities and people together. And that's why I thought that my friend Ruth would be so uh, helpful and important for having a conversation with me today in her room of books as well. Um, and just before we begin talking, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ruth, I would just like to share a little information about her. All right, Ruth, just right. for a moment, <laughs> for a little background as we begin to talk about different topics. Ruth Edmonds Hill is coordinator of oral history projects for the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Among them are the Black Women Oral History Project, Women in the Federal Government, one on the National Organization for Women, and currently one on Chinese American women. She has presented lectures and workshops for many venues in the United States and abroad, and was the producer of a storytelling event for Lincoln Center Out of Doors and organized 10 years of travels for Women of Courage. I have right in my library here, a photographic exhibition based on the Black Women Oral History Project. A longtime member of the Oral History Association she has served on a number of committees and on the editorial board of the Oral History Review. She authored the foreword to Keeping Family Stories Alive by Vera Rosenbluth and has contributed to Radcliffe Quarterly, Notable Black American Women and African American National Biography. And uh, as uh, in addition to this bio, I see that Ruth husband was the noted storyteller Brother Blue, and Ruth is the great granddaughter of the Reverend Samuel Harrison, chaplain of the famed Massachusetts 54th Regiment in the Civil War. Uh, that's a lot about me. <laughs> I know, and now we're just going to talk together. Um, Ruth, and it's it's just it's uh, as a friend, it is uh, a joy and uh, privilege. And uh, as you, I see you also, in addition to a uh, dear friend as a mentor uh, to me. So it is an honor also that you join me uh, for this time talking together. So I just wanted to give folks a little idea of your background, but I know if people go online to you know, Wikipedia and the different articles in there, they'll learn more about you and Brother Blue as well. And I have uh, copied a few of them that maybe I'll uh, join in some quotes at some point in our talk here today. So are you ready to go? Does Wikipedia has a thing about me? I should look myself. Yes, up. yes. <laughs> There's <laughs> something on both, both you and Brother Blue in there. Yeah, um, yeah. I would expect of... him to be, but I'm surprised that I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you have your very own page. Okay. So good. you might want to read it sometime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Ruth, uh, now that I've introduced you uh, and your, your bio, your background, I know you have been a guest on um, 
a number of programs that I have hosted at HKM TV and also for local storytelling through the years. Mm -hmm. I got to know you through our mutual friend, Linda Havel, a storyteller and poet. And I know the first time that we met, and that's gonna be the theme for our first collection of community stories. Mm -hmm. Tell about the first time you met someone, a stranger, a perfect stranger. <laughs> First time we met, and then we went out for our first uh, outing together so, uh, soon after. We went to the Museum of Fine Arts. And I remember with you that we were going to look for some particular exhibit, which I don't remember. Maybe you do. No, I don't remember either. <laughs> it was a special exhibit. And we spent four hours nonstop looking at art in that museum. And I was ready to go because I'd never been with anyone before who just wanted to keep going and keep looking at the art and not take a break. In fact, I was thirsty and hungry by the end. And I said, whoa, I think maybe by now we better take a break. Uh, <laughs> well, I always enjoyed going to the museum with you because you were as open of as anyone, you were wanting to look at everything too. So, yeah. So even though we took a long time, you stuck with it. <laughs> yes, uh, we ha we have been a good team, um, and as we call uh, going on adventures. Uh, yeah, that's it, adventures. <laughs> <laughs> and our common love for art and stories and books and adventures, even if it's driving in the car and the GPS doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm not we're- sure I trust them sometimes. I'm sorry, what? I'm not sure I trusted GPS because I remember wanting to go uh, from home to a southerly direction. But in order to do the southerly direction, they, they took me to the east and then north and then around and finally, <laughs> <laughs> they, they admit that I want to go so, suddenly. <laughs> yes, we've had some mysterious uh, travels uh, yeah. together, I know. Um, so, um, but I always think that, you know, it's the time that we have on the adventure together yeah. that yes. is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that is also a bit of the, you know, the, the, message about you, the, the mantra about you. Uh, and uh, with uh, the community of people who've been by your side uh, in the journey of our lives and mm -hmm. with you as a guide there. And uh, that goes true for your late husband, Brother Blue. Um, and I invited you, you know, to help me debut this new storytelling event that will be on Zoom for a while uh, because I believe that stories and storytelling can bring us together, uh, especially the focus of true stories. Um, and maybe that's part of my background and being in psychology and kind of seeing how that worked back in time. I'm going to interrupt because when I was growing up, you never would have called a story true. Stories were something that you imagined. <laughs> right, yes, uh-huh, yeah. Times have changed a lot. Times have changed, that's mm -hmm. right. And um, I think I had the first, uh, the same impression of stories at first and it took some uh, being open yeah, uh, something new like storytelling, like oh, everything. After I uh, came from psychology and went into community arts, yes, and went to an open mic and saw everybody kind of you know showing or speaking their truth through their art of poetry or stories, yes, mm -hmm. or paintings, right? <clears throat> um, so I think that you and Brother Blue really. Uh, are viewed as the founders and leaders uh, of uh, storytelling, the importance of storytelling for our area and for the world. Because I know that both of you went to different places in the world because of storytelling. Because of storytelling. You were invited to. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was, I want to talk about that, but I wonder if you could uh, start uh, with a, a little story yourself, because I understand um, today is the anniversary uh, for you and Brother Blue of your uh, wedding. And I wonder if you could tell the story. Uh, uh, Brother Blue passed away in 2009. Nine, yes, mm -hmm. in November, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, that, the I know... way we met is so unusual, too. Oh, but, could uh, you tell us? Uh... And how we got married is more unusual. Oh, oh, maybe we could hear two stories then. <laughs> two stories. <laughs> Well, uh, I was going to Simmons, it used to be Simmons College, but now Simmons University and the library program and living in Cambridge with a relative of my mother. And I just thought, well, it'd be nice to meet some people. And so I heard about a, a sorority gathering. I wasn't interested in sorority particularly, but I decided to go to the event. And there are all these women, shall we say, sitting around the big place and nobody talking to each other. And finally I said, well, uh, I thought this was what I used to call them get acquainted events. I don't know whether they still call them that or not. I said, I thought this was a get acquainted event. And so their, their response was, we're waiting for the boys to come. So evidently women didn't talk to each other. They only talked to the boys, quote unquote. <laughs> uh -huh. And so among the boys was this man named Hugh Morgan Hill. And that's how we first met. So, uh, and it turned out to be a dance. We, I never went to dances. I didn't like going to dances and sitting around and being looked at, for example, and having them decide whether or not I was worth dancing with. Yeah. And so he kept asking and I kept saying no. And finally he just pulled <laughs> my chair out into the middle of the room and he danced around the chair. Wow. <laughs> You, you might know, being Brother Blue, that it was going to be an unusual way. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So did that work? After a while, yes. And I thought, well, he's interesting. Yes, yes. So he's interesting, unique, he's right? interesting enough for me to, you know, to spend time with him a little. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> and so he danced around a chair and he danced into your heart a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. It took, it took a while for me to think, oh, yeah, he's, he's worth dealing with. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so, wow. Well, and then uh, how long did you date um, before you got married? Well, I don't remember that, but I know that I was working in the Harvard Business School Library and I had a phone call. And uh, at the time, uh, you know, beginning career, you didn't have your own office. So the director of the library came and said, I have a phone call for you in my office. And so I went. And there was the marriage proposal. <laughs> <laughs> it never would have occurred to me to ask anyone to marry them over the phone like that. <laughs> but there it was, and I said yes. And, and you so said yes. Uh -huh. That was the beginning of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Everything it was no, what shall we say? No pattern. Everything was, you just never knew what was going to happen when. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, um, no pattern. Uh, and that was the beginning of how many years together uh, as a married couple? Well, 19. Oh, I don't know. Need to do some arithmetic. Oh, here. that. <laughs> yeah, that I don't have that uh, date uh, bios here either. No, uh, but but it would have been couple decades. Yes, at least. <laughs> Probably longer. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I know that uh, you were a force, a team. Um, uh, from my knowing you before I got to know you as a friend, uh, knowing mm -hmm. you and Brother Blue as a leader of storytelling. Yeah. Well, that that people just didn't know that I even had a career or anything in libraries and it just assumed that she follows brother blue and that's it so yes and it's, me. what's that that was fine with me mm -hmm. yeah um and um what's what's interesting is that you you know you didn't even know about brother blue he didn't even know he was going to become so involved in stories at that time right 
Well, for a while we lived in Pittsfield, which was my hometown. And he, well, let's go back up a bit. He had gone to Yale Drama School. And so he was interested in writing plays and, and getting his play work done. Um, but in Pittsfield, he was just still writing. That was all he was doing. And so on a Sunday afternoon, we'd invite people in and he would sort of talk, tell them what he was working on, what he was writing. But eventually he stopped looking at the paper and that in a way became the beginning of what he call, we called storytelling. We didn't think of it as storytelling. We just said, oh, he's talking about the work that he's doing. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and so in um, a way, that's, that was the beginning of it without our knowing it. And mm -hmm. what, what was he writing? Well, just different plays that came to plays. his mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what he was writing at that particular time. Um, I can't even think of the years that we were there because there's so many things that have happened in my life. So. I know, I know. And, and that's all right. We can just kind of uh, explore yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> while we talk today. While we talk, yeah. So um, I know uh, there's a lot to ask about. Well, how about this quote that I found this morning? And I found this interview uh, through Spare Change. Oh, yeah. It, mm -hmm. it looks like back, um, this is uh, printed in 2009 by Spare Change. And uh, it looks like it was an interview where you both uh, asked each other questions. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, and uh, I, th I think it's really beautiful what, I, what I'm reading here from the interview. Um, and he, uh, there's somebody else in here also named Louise Stewart, mm -hmm. who probably helped with the interview. Uh, but this is one thing that Brother Blue said, um, that he said to you, listen, baby, we are a team an order of two, trying to change the world. That's what I think marriage is. Two people under the guidance of heaven, bringing forth babies. The stories I tell are born of Blo Brother Blue and Ruth. They are like children born of two. Yes, I'm a dreamer, but heaven sent you to keep to me to keep me in touch with this world yes, he definitely needed that <laughs> without you i might stray from the beat the music of the lead line thank you even as we're talking here you've been pulling me back in the lead line um and he said you spoke of the facts the concrete things you had done and here it is some of the concrete down-to-earth things about me to show um i'm not jiving um, and he tells a little bit about what he has done through storytelling. And then I want to go back to you, but he said, I've traveled across the country and Canada telling stories in the streets and prisons, in schools and universities. I founded and am directing storytelling workshops for Harvard University, many other colleges and university. I've been to seven countries where I've told stories in streets, parks, cathedrals, prisons, universities, barefoot in the snow in the Alps. <laughs> Whoa, Switzerland, following my sacred calling, trying to change the world. I also was the official storyteller for the United Nations Habitat Forum. And on, one more note, a grace note. If anybody asked you why I do what I do, just say that Brother Blue is a fool for God, oh. is what he said. <laughs> In that interview, I said, wow. <laughs> this I've interview, is, <laughs> you, you, you both covered a lot of ground in that interview. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, you know, we all often start with a story of Blue when we think about storytelling. Um, but I, I think it's really interesting how you were doing the same thing from a different angle in uh, exploring and uh, dealing with the interviews and archives of women in oral history uh, over at Radcliffe at the Schlesinger, the Schlesinger Library. Library. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, back since 1970s, right? Seven, 77, yes. 77, yes. yeah. And uh, you were working uh, most every day for, you know, part of the day at least, uh, right up through when this uh, pandemic hit. 
Yes, when everybody had to go home, <laughs> so to speak. That's you right. Know, I was doing uh, oh so many different uh, projects. I don't I I should count them sometime, but it was a Black Women Oral History Project, a Chinese one, a Latina, uh, one about Radcliffe College alumni, uh, National Organization for Women, uh, Women in U.S. Federal Government. Did I say Cambodian? Yeah, that, so there's a lot of different okay. projects that I uh -huh. worked at over the years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is a lot of work. It's mm -hmm. a lot of stories, Ruth. Yes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. of, of women's lives. Some and people, women being able to tell their lives in whatever way was best for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so in a way, you have been a, a story keeper. And That's a good way of putting it. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and what what have you found to be uh, the importance of of doing this work um, of collecting these stories and in particular for women mm. in history? Well, let me. Uh, the first project that I worked on was the Black Women Oral History Project, and one never would have thought of anything of that nature at Radcliffe or, or the Schlesinger Library. Uh, but there was an African-American woman on the advisory committee of the library. And I don't know, I'm, of course, this is before my time, so I don't know how she got involved. But she said, well, it would be good to expand what we're doing here at the library. And if you want uh, African-American women, they're not going to give you their papers, but let's do it our history project and go from there. And so that was the beginning of opening up the collections of the Schlesinger Library in so many different ways, yes, mm -hmm. that project. And, uh, oh, I, I just, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just, as things pop into my head. Sure, I'll, sure, <laughs> that's how we're doing it. I thought of how, how my mother got involved and yeah. so it was an advisory committee for the project and we used to meet or sometimes just, I would just send mails to them with uh, ideas about what was, uh, well, I don't know, I'm, let's say maybe five, 10, ten women that I would suggest. And uh, we would have a discussion and decide who was, uh, whether that person would be involved. And uh, so I put my mother's name on the list one time mm -hmm. and we happened to be meeting in person in Washington, DC and uh, so they ex took her name and said, yes, she'd be good to do. And uh, after they had gone a while and they, someone said, oh, what is your maiden name? And so I admitted what my maiden name was, my married name rather, <laughs> and uh, uh -huh. which was my mother's uh, uh, Florence. She was Florence Jacobs Edmonds. And so when they saw Ruth Edmonds, they said, oh, you're related? I said, that she's my mother. And so I was so happy that she got in without my saying, oh, you should interview my mother, that she just got in on her own. <laughs> uh -huh. well, yeah. well, that makes it uh, extra special, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I know she have in her in the, as part of the project, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, and um, can you say a few words of what your mother, uh, what uh, she is acknowledged for in this book? Well, she was a public health nurse. She, uh, we grew up in the Berkshires and uh, she wanted to go to nurses training and there is a hospital and training, there was a training school right near us, but they weren't accepting uh, black women. And she found a place in New York City where she went and got her training. Wow. And, uh, she eventually came back and she didn't do anything. She got married and started to raise the family. But at some point she just, oh, this was in uh, what we call World War II. She decided to do what she called home nursing classes for uh, women who were interested. And she would just go visit them and, and, and or they could come to her or whatever, but she was teaching classes. And the Visiting Nurse Association heard about it and invited her to just become part of them. And so she eventually became a visiting nurse and was, uh, and it was all because of that background of having the nursing and not doing anything with it, but they, they found her very personable 
and uh, we're glad to have her for many years. So. Wow. So mm -hmm. she was a leader. Uh, in that sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, that's pretty special to have um, not only as a story in a book and archives, but for uh, advancing our history in yes. this country mm -hmm. and for her uh, advances um, for Black women back in time and for our whole country to yeah. mm -hmm. advance mm -hmm. forward. Um, and so uh, you have been doing this work with uh, different groups of women and uh, the NOW organization and oh, there's a lot of history, right? Oh, and the I can't even remember the names of all the women that, because it's such a long period of time and uh, most of it was, uh, well, would, would have been back 1970s, 80s, that kind of thing. So you continue the work, but uh, you move from one project to another. And I just don't remember all the names. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, if you look back at it all, all, all that archive work over time, transcribing tapes, right? And well, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> you didn't have to do that. Okay. That didn't help. <laughs> uh huh. All right. But the management of all of that we is keep track of it was something it's incredible. Yeah. And we didn't have the big computers and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so looking back at it all, uh, why, why would you say this is important for us now? Well, I think we all need to share stories and be able to be open to other people's lives. You can't assume that just because you lived a certain way that someone else lived that same way or thinks the same way. I just think it's important to to be open to other people's stories and lives. So it's difficult at times, Yeah, but you just have to do it. Yes, mm -hmm. or you should do it. Let's put it that way, yeah. Well, well, thank you. We got our thesis statement for today for oh. the program. <laughs> I didn't even know you were gonna say that. I didn't know what your answer well, I was. don't know what I'm gonna say either. <laughs> so that's good, we could just share. Well, that, yeah, thank you for, um, for sharing that, I, I agree with you. That is so important. Um, and uh, you know, I uh, used to interview and write people's life stories in hospice for people at the end of life. Oh, mm -hmm. I would I would say I came to that same conclusion um, that uh, we all need to hear and learn from one another's stories mm -hmm. uh, for uh, being a united uh, community and world and and uh, expanding our understanding growing and learning ourselves as well as uh, one another and that in the doing so we also learn ourselves mm -hmm. I, I that's what i would see the patients what would happen to them yes mm -hmm. that you know we're uh, as i learned from one hospice psychiatrist as as we share our stories and and uh, you know, even in our very last days, he was dealing with veterans of World War II. And he said, uh, we're growing and we're changing every day with every last breath we have. He would tell the, the veterans that and, and they would, he would invite them to tell the stories they've been holding for so long, which made them miserable. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that many goes, people have stories that they just haven't told that they probably should tell and yeah. share uh, both for their own uh, well, I was going to, I forget what word I was going to use, but, but to help them continue to live the way they should live openly. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And for people to understand them. Yes. Mm. Maybe why they're, why they, they, have they, the way they do. <laughs> uh -huh. like, let's say, well, let's put it this way. Why they are nasty when they're nasty <laughs> and, yeah. and yeah. why they're nice when they're nice. But uh -huh. you know, yes, you need to be open to other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so Brother Blue, as far as we talked about his story, is that um, he danced around a chair and eventually you got married, he proposed on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so then you were together and Blue was writing plays and you were getting involved in your work. In well, he, st he stopped writing plays uh, because we, we came to Cambridge and... Um, there used to be something on the Cambridge Common, I forget what it was called, on Sundays. And it would go from, who I guess it would start at noon, it would go, but there'd be dancing, singing, all kinds of things going on. And we used to 
go every so often. And at one point he just said, oh, why don't I try stories? And so he just found a corner and uh, started telling, st uh, I guess Shakespeare is what he began with. I can't tell you which Shakespeare play, but b began with uh, maybe Romeo and Juliet or something like that and found that people enjoyed them. And uh, he said, well, maybe this is what I want to do. He, he had no idea what he really was going to do because it's not easy to get a play produced uh, anywhere. And uh, eventually he went to uh, Harvard Square and started telling stories. So, um, and he loved it. He must have come alive, right? When he did that. Just, just that was that was it. And it was interesting to see people come down the street, come down Brattle Street, and find this man with, you know, butterflies on his face and hands and balloons and telling stories and then they're wondering oh what's this going on and they would just think it was funny but then they would listen and they would get involved and that was a whole whole different thing so huh. yeah. so in a way that's the big career started at, at, at in harvard square i would say yes mm -hmm. yeah. and he loved that right he loved it and he came alive yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you were his grounding force helping supporting him through it well, the way I put it was sometimes it's like uh, with, a, with a kite that uh, you have to let it go up and do what it has to do. And then you pull it back down to earth. And so <laughs> I felt that, I, that he was, it was, that was our relationship sometimes. Yeah. 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 Well, we all need, we all need both, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. Blue helped us all expand uh, by listening to him and flying with him yes. and mm -hmm. getting our mm -hmm. own uh, kite wings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And we have to take care of each other, too. And here's mm -hmm. something that I found um, also in this interview that kind of uh, supports what you're saying and tells about his butterfly story. He says, when I was a little boy, I felt this urge to help ease the suffering in the world. I couldn't stand to see people, animals and creatures suffering. I didn't like to see people pick flowers because I believed it hurt the flowers. It was killing the flowers. You might say this was a call to my soul. It's like a priest, a minister, a rabbi being called to serve God and all God's creatures. I guess I was born with this calling, but I must say uh, definitely that by being the only black kid in my neighborhood in my school, I experienced rejection. I was the outsider in an all white world. I was like on black button in a field of snow. We were poor in the real sense of the word, but there was a teacher in my school who believed in me. She looked past the muddy water in my eyes. She saw my beautiful butterfly, something inside me like my soul. She heard my cry from yearning in me. She called me the butterfly out of me with love. I was dying inside. And she said she saw something beautiful in me, something with wings like a butterfly. Then I knew my body, my color, my skin, all of that was like a cocoon holding something inside of me that was immortal. I fell in love with that teacher. How could I help it? I tried to be what she saw in me, the butterfly. I think that. Yes, well, that's what he has the story of, of Miss Wonderland. That was uh, oh. her name. And uh -huh. so if you've ever heard about Miss Wonderland, it was that teacher in whatever grade school level he was at that uh, just uh, was open to him. And, and so it helped him a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an amazing story. And you know, shows the power of teacher or someone in our life who someone says, who, yeah, who is open to you and accepts you as you are and is willing, is willing to help you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then he, he did that. You both did that as a mm -hmm. team in different ways, but you did that for community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Blue also went on to a divinity school uh, to learn he, about he, ministry, he, right? He attended both Yale and Harvard divinity school, but the structure was more than he was able to cope with, shall we say. And yeah. it just wasn't his thing because he was just more open and uh, didn't, didn't follow any particular, what you call it, religion or whatever you want to call it, but he didn't follow any particular pattern and he was just opened. So uh, so he brought it anywhere. Mm -hmm. He would go, like you said, he was on the Harvard Square Commons and the parks and barefoot in the Alps, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it was the Alps, but um, I just thought of uh, how we got to uh, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia was uh, there were a couple of different ways, but uh, 
a man who was a professor at a university there and he had some kind of visiting scholarship over in Albany, New York, but he wanted to see, you know, everybody wants to see Harvard Square kind of thing. He knew about that. And he just was uh, listened to Brother Blue. And then at some point uh, he introduced himself when, uh, when there was a break and there weren't too many people around and uh, he invited us to Russia. And that's how we eventually got there. So you just never know wh wh what's gonna change your life. You, yeah. you you, uh, it could be as simple as that. It's just going out, talking to people, telling stories and that's just, it's just amazing the, yeah. the, the life that I've had because of him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, I should say it that way because I've had my interesting life at the Schlesinger Library and, and the different projects I've worked on. But uh, but I wasn't doing the interviewing. My job was to see that the projects were done. So, yeah. uh, but to actually share the life of someone who was able to really be with people, accept them as they are, talk to them. Yes, yeah. it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, like that teacher did and yes. like you both did as teachers and I love what you said you know every your whole life can change with yes. just sharing your story in some way yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, Blue went to many different places Russia and uh, Europe We've been and... to Sweden been to Scotland been to Italy mm -hmm. mm. Church churches Right. Oh, they, 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 you never knew what they were going to be. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. the Sweden was just a storytelling conference. Uh, Italy was some other kind of conference uh, with somebody who was planning to run for an office up in Vermont or something or other. But for some reason, I don't know, I can't remember why he decided to. Uh, oh, that he was connected with Buckminster Fuller. Uh, that and so that's how he got to go to, to Italy to, for some kind of conference that they were doing jointly. I can't even remember the names of things at this point. You know, and Buckminster Fuller does not sleep all night long. I can tell you that. Ah, <laughs> oh, uh, and what is that, Buckminster? Because he was in a room next to ours at some point in one of these conferences, and oh, and so he would be. I can't remember whether he was loud or whether he was walking around or what, but. But he, he's not a sleeper, let's put it that way. His mind is working. <laughs> uh huh. Um, so, also, I know that uh, Brother Blue brought stories to prison. It sounds like a couple different prisons. Oh, over yes, time. yes, because we met some. Uh, oh, well, it's an in, uh, involved story. I can't remember how this happened, but the bookcases here were built by a man who was a minister over in uh, Boston somewhere, I can't remember where now, but he also uh, did went to prisons. And so he invited Br Brother Blue to come. And so that uh, the Brother Blue's prison ministry, so to speak, it developed uh, from that. And so some of it was his talking to the men and sometimes encouraging them to tell their own stories or to, or share whatever they wanted to share. It didn't have to be story in the strict sense. Yes. So, yeah. And but the, but the prison ministry began in, in that way, which I had forgotten that the bookcase is here. <laughs> How about that? A little bit of yeah. present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and were you with him when he went into the prisons? Yes. Yes. I always went. Mm -hmm. and, and what would you say? What did you witness? How was that uh, important for uh, the people, the men uh, that he would share stories with or ask stories? Well, it was hard at first for them to see what, what's this man doing coming here? Uh, wants to talk with us. He's not a minister, really. So what's going on? And uh, so he, uh, those who wanted to come would just come and gather and he would start talking. And eventually it would evolve into the stories and, and inviting them to share stories. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so he was, in that sense, he was a teacher for them also. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. it, it, it I always uh, liked going to tell you the truth. Yeah. Did, did you yeah. ever see, what did you witness happen for them, for the men there when they were part of that? Well, to, to, because they were out in a place where they would share, whether it be, I don't know how many at, 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 at this point, it's hard to look, think back. Uh, I know. Yeah. might have come, but uh, 
but for them to know each other's stories was that they didn't know. They just yeah. were in their, what you say, cages in a sense and locked up. And uh, they just weren't able to share anything and nobody knew why they were there. But, but so they were able to just open up and, and mm -hmm. even sometimes it was, would be a confessional even, you know, I'm mm -hmm. sorry I did this. But other times it was just maybe talking about their lives or whatever they wanted to to, yeah. to mention. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think, he, you know, it sounds like uh, he was ahead of his time showing, you know, the possibility of reform and that storytelling can be transformative for yeah. people's mm -hmm. lives too, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you both went on to um, bring, to create storytelling opportunities for a community, for people to come forth mm -hmm. and share mm -hmm. their stories in addition to him telling his. Yeah. Well, it started in, in Cambridge, up in North Cambridge. I can't even remember the place, but down there was a basement uh, near a post office in, in uh, North Cambridge. Uh, yeah, I guess it would be North Cambridge, a little past Porter Square. And uh, there would be music and I can't remember what it really was, but we went occasionally. And so one time he just said to the people running the place, you know, do you think it'd be okay to, to do some storytelling? Hmm. So whoever just happened to be there that night, uh, he told stories. I don't remember what he told, obviously, because it's so long ago, but uh, they enjoyed it. And so he encouraged people to come up and tell some stories. And that's how it all began, very informally. No idea of, of developing storytelling, but uh, just being open to the idea and say, because he did it. And so maybe some other people would like to do it too. So we ended up there for a while, eventually in Central Square in Cambridge and different places uh, the, that we've been and developed a, a storytelling community, as you say. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And really it went on fire and eventually kind of grew and, and changed the movement of uh, valuing storytelling mm. uh, with a larger and larger community. And, that, and yeah, that was... that's it. More and more people began to come once they'd heard about it and also felt that they could tell stories too. And so it yeah. just, it, it had its own way of developing, let's put it that way. But it was just uh, the, his openness helped. Yeah, oh. that anybody can tell a story. I remember that when I went to those open mics, sometimes scared to death to speak <laughs> up in there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was also excited because I was getting permission that I could come up and say anything and be okay. And in fact, yeah. he would make it beautiful. <laughs> and he, uh, so he knew how to always encourage people too. Yeah. Uh, yeah either before to come and tell a story, but after they had told it, to say something that was, uh, well, it wasn't, I don't know how to say it, but, but you all, he always found something good to say about whatever the person had done. Yes, in some way or other. I know, know I asked you not long ago, uh, you know, considering these times and how divided uh, our country has been in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what if somebody came up and uh, they told a story or began speaking in a way that might make people feel divided or, you know, it had something contrary to Brother Blue's uh, beliefs. And uh, could you say that? Well, I don't know. Somehow just uh, uh, if you knew you were there for stories, somehow you were open mm -hmm. and you just accepted whatever it was that people wanted to tell you about their lives or something they made up or whatever it was. But uh, you wouldn't have been there in a way if you didn't want to hear quote unquote stories. So, yeah. uh, so it was good in, in that sense. People were just uh, open to the idea of whatever you wanted to offer us, we're going to accept. Yeah. Hmm. I remember you also said um, if something like that happened and somebody had like, you know, a platform to say something that was dividing or could, you know, uh, ruffle some people's feathers or even perhaps, you know, brother blew his own beliefs, he would allow him to speak or her yes. and um, not say anything, let them have their time, listen. Yes, yes. And then might afterward offer not 
uh, an opposite perspective, but a little story that might have you think about a little different perspective. And, you know, they have training for this at True Story Theater uh, that I've been attending, Upstander Training, where you learn about listening to people who have views different than your own to try to think about working and listening and um, being more united mm -hmm. as opposed to divided in our, in our getting along these yeah. days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he was doing that ahead of his time too. Yeah. And I've heard of True Story Theater, but I'm trying to think whether I've ever been to any of it or seen it. I'm not sure. Is well, this, they do great is it work like there. Like radio or television or something? Um, well, now they're on Zoom, like everything. Oh, yeah, like um, everything. I, <laughs> I think they would come and bring... Um, Yes, I even I was a part of one. They would uh, act out uh, situations and stories. Oh, I know that's it. Yes, yes. I think I had been to one up in Arlington. Where that's right. You, yeah. You give a, you throw out some ideas and they make it into all of it, the ideas into a story. Is that the idea? Mm. That's yeah. right. They would yeah try to instead of like, you know, be a teaching or giving PowerPoints on this is how you talk and listen and get along together. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they give you experience. You feel yeah. it because yeah. you're in, in role yes. on these uh, working out difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they're very good at that. And brother blue was doing that ahead of his time. Once again, yes. <laughs> Without thinking about it. he was just there doing it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, it was, was it the 90s when you got started with uh, offering opportunity for community to come and tell stories? Hmm. Or earlier? No, it seems to me it would have been uh, earlier because uh, he would have been telling stories in Harvard Square back in 1970s, late 1970s. And somehow, I would say it would be late 1970s, early 1980s, the, whatever okay. it was that began, yes. Where mm -hmm. you gave permission to the community to come yes. and tell their mm -hmm. stories. And, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that both of you are so loved um, by community uh, in remembering those days and all that transpired forward and how Blue's uh, legend of being just like his teacher was to him, this this butterfly, yes. part <laughs> minister, part storyteller, you know, part uh, person, just a peace builder, really talking about love, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just as he said in his interview there, you know, doing the best uh, to to come alive and, and try to make the world a little better from. Mm, yes, yes, that's what we all want to do. So yeah, we're trying, we're... but it's difficult today. So yeah. It seems to be yeah. difficult some days, yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'd like to think that what the two of you did um, in all these opportunities uh, for people to share their stories and learn from stories that that is part of the spark still with us all mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that helps us to face these times and remember and and think about the the great importance of stories and trying to move forward and transform and grow really and i i am hearing from some uh medical uh, experts and psychological experts these days, even the medical schools are opening up to uh, story, using stories as a means of healing. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And they are listening to some experts who have done this uh, more traditionally as part of uh, medicine and healing in Native American yes. uh, mm -hmm. groups, uh, uh, different cultures uh, and tribes and they are using um, the same kind of idea, in particular with Louis Mel Madrona, who's written a number of books and, and really says that stories are medicine and psychology for us, as well as mm -hmm. fun and entertainment and yes, performance, yes. all those things. All of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we carry our stories with us. And when we share them, it makes the world uh, expand, right? And get a little hopefully, better hopefully <laughs> <laughs> um and uh and it also does something for our own health according to the experts now they're saying we we learn to release what we're holding in which are you know the different kinds of stories of our life and 
and we actualize them, we let them, we let them move on instead of holding them in, and and uh, that's better for our, our health. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so what what would you say? As I see, we have about eight minutes left. Uh, how any thoughts on how you see storytelling and how it's growing, how it's good for individuals and community in general and for uh, the times we've been going through? Yeah, I was just thinking of uh, uh, organizations that we were involved in that uh, helped get started was the uh, National Association of Black Storytellers mm -hmm. because yeah. uh, I guess it was in Jonesboro, Tennessee, I forget what they called it, but they would have storytelling every summer in Tennessee and we would go. But they there'd be thousands of people there, but, but so few uh, black people. And so there was one summer, I'm trying to think of her name, uh, Mary Carter Smith and Brother Blue were both there. And I don't, we, they may have been the only two. But uh, she said, you know, we really ought to uh, do our own storytelling in some way or other. And so when she wanted to start the, the organization, she didn't want to call, didn't call it an organization at that point, but she wanted to do something for African-American people to be able to tell their own stories, hear their own stories. And uh, we've been with them for all these years. And so it would have been in the... Who knows whether it would have been in the 18, 1980s or something like that. But uh, an organization that stayed for, for all these many years. And it was just because uh, people need to hear their own stories and tell their own stories. Yes. It's not enough just to listen to everybody else's story and the story of their lives, so to speak. But you want to share your own story, in whatever way you want to do it. So, Absolutely. Uh, the yes. National Association of Black Storytelling is still going. So, uh, so the, Mary Carter Smith is no longer with us, but one another woman is who's who was co-founder of it. So yeah, well, it just uh, amazes me that, and I'm sure that's how some other storytelling groups began. You went and you heard somebody, and you said, "Oh, our people aren't there. We've got to do our own thing." So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just glad that we that we've been involved in that. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm I'm so glad too in the preservation of those stories. And I know you've taken the train even after Blue has passed away to go yeah. and be a part of that mm -hmm. uh, across the country every year. Yeah, yeah, because you could do folk tales, but you could also do stories of your lives. There was no limit on the kind of things that you could tell or wanted to tell. It was just open to all. Oh, whatever you felt you wanted or needed to tell yes mm. yeah well um you know uh once again uh, all these all these little moments that you're coming up with and we see how they uh are all these sparks that add on to the momentum of us as a people yes yes mm -hmm. right and you say oh that's just one day and that happened it's like no that changed the direction <laughs> and the history of us yes yes mm -hmm. so um, I don't know. We have just a couple. Oh, just a very few minutes left. Um, any favorite uh, story of yours of Brother Blues you want to end with? Well, I was thinking of being in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I, he was out in a park telling stories. Yeah. It was in English, but he was telling stories. <laughs> and uh, there was a man there who was drawing. We didn't know that. But after uh, we stopped, he came up and he'd been drawing on a, a, a newspaper page. And he uh, brought it to uh, and gave it to us. And so I've had all these long years. I can just look. I've had it on the wall in my office. And I can wow. sit there and look up and see this drawing of Brother Blue that this man in a park in Russia in St. Petersburg had done. Wow. wow. And it was just so generous of him, we felt to give it to us. But uh, it just, uh, you just, you just never know what somebody gets involved in with you in whatever way. And they do, they give you their art and you give them your art. It's wow. Uh, uh -huh. it's just great sharing. So. Yeah, that's beautiful. And 
Thank you. Well, I see we're just about uh, to an hour and I have one more quote I wanted to end on my part and then to ask you if there's one more thing you want to say to close. But here's one more part of that wonderful interview uh, from Spare Change Brother Blue saying to you, we've been together a long time. You've heard me tell many stories and I've watched you in your work collecting oral history over the years. But though we know a great deal about each other's work and each other's aspirations in the work, there is much that we don't know. Let us ask questions as though we don't know the answers and ask questions we've never asked each other before. How should we begin? And I think, whoa, that's a, you know, that is a question for us all to yes, ask one all, another, right? Especially for people who are married couples or they don't have to be married, but, you know, people who live together, who share lives together, there's so much to to ask that you don't know, to talk about, discuss, yeah. yeah so uh, we were always able to talk about either what we were doing or what was going on in the world because uh, he was a very open person. So yeah. you could just yeah. about discuss anything with him, yeah. which I appreciate it, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and and one thing I remember is uh, coming home from work and he would meet me, He oh, this, because he wasn't going out at, at, at certain times, but uh, he would meet me at the back door and I would come in and the first thing up, he would just hug me and uh, we wouldn't say anything. And uh -huh. so I just look forward to that. <laughs> that's a good memory indeed. And it's that's like medicine too, that we're all craving now, right? Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, um, yeah, my uh, husband told me something on uh, news, probably some sort of data that at least six or seven hugs a day is, is uh, like good medicine. Um, uh, for us, it's it's some some sort of scientific thing he he oh. heard somewhere, <laughs> but uh, you know in these days where uh, we can't do it, and I know I got a lot of hugs in the storytelling community and gave them too. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. We can also do it for ourselves and think of the people we love. Yes. And mm -hmm. so I I want to give a hug to you, Ruth, who I haven't seen for a long time yes, now. I know I miss <laughs> seeing you and sharing with you. Yes. We and a hug for our brother Blue, too. And mm -hmm. I thank you so much. Is there any last thing you'd well, like I'll to just say? say? Thank you for asking me to, to talk about all these things that have been going on with storytelling, with lives, and so forth. Yes, it's just a thank you for, I appreciate being able to talk to you about all these things. And I know hopefully you're going to let other people hear us talk, too. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I look forward to that and keeping you and Brother Blue uh, as a, a mentoring for me as I go forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll be telling you what's going on and I look forward to our next adventures too. All right. Thank you. All right. You. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank Take care. You. Happy anniversary day of, for you and Brother Blue too. Yeah, yeah. Sending love to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.